Hey, what's up? It's episode 79, pain points of wealth, and markets are going up, they're going down, they're going sideways. Markets aren't going anywhere, but they've been extremely volatile as interest rates continue to climb higher. You've got two-thirds of economists now talking about a potential recession. We're going to tell you what we think about a recession, what the economy is really going to do over the next 12 months. And on the tipping point today, we're going to talk about your emotions. Your emotions are holding you back from making good investment decisions. We're going to tell you how to fix that. We got a great show. Hit the music. Hey guys, so far it's been an interesting year. You know, if you look at the Dow, it looks like an electrocardiogram, you know, with a, a patient having a heart attack. I mean, we were at 37,000 in January, uh, almost, uh, well, all the way down to 32,000, now around 34,000. Um, like you said, Rye, lots of volatility going nowhere fast. Well, you know what, guys? I was talking to a client of mine this week, and they told me that things are worse than they've ever been. They said, our portfolio is doing terrible. I said, well, you're down 3.8% for the year. I said, but do you remember back in March of 2020 when you were down close to 20%? I said, things aren't that bad. Well, it's kind of interesting because, you know, right, we have days the market's up, the market's down, and the news really hasn't changed, right? And we've, we've got this conflict in Ukraine. We've got a war going on. Uh, in addition to that, we know interest rates are continuing to go higher. That hasn't really changed. And we've got rampant inflation. And, you know, all the news, the news cycle continues to be the same message the market just seems to be reading that message differently day to day. Well, whenever you get this kind of volatility, um, sometimes that means there's going to be a change in leadership in the market. So what's that mean? Well, the last 15 years, we've had growth stocks outperforming just about every other asset class, and now they're lagging behind value. So what we're seeing is more inflation, right? Everybody sees that in their day to day life. You're seeing the CPI number and interest rates are going up. So you're having a price adjustment but it's not impacting all parts of the economy or the market like we've warned over the last 78 broadcasts. No, because we've talked about those long duration assets, right? You talk about bond funds and these long term bond funds and, and growth stocks, which are most sensitive to what happens with interest rates. And, you know, we like to talk about that ARC fund, Kathy Woods. It's kind of like the symbol of disruptive technology. And right, we've seen this huge sell off or correction in the price of that ETF. And it had a big bounce in the last couple of weeks. And as we're recording this, now it's going down again. And you know, to your point, Bob, it's just, you're right, not all markets are acting the same. I look at a value portfolio like we have in our strategy, you know, it's, it's actually slightly up for the year as we're recording this. It's like completely different market action than what you're seeing in other parts of the market. Well, I'll tell you what, guys, I'm really, I'm really bullish on these, uh, these long duration assets because they provide this great thing in our portfolio. It's called a tax loss harvest, uh, especially in the ARC fund. I have that for a couple of clients, been able to swap that out and get the tax loss. Chris, I thought you were like a better hockey goalie than that. How'd you let that ARC fund get into the net? Uh, you know what, Dad? Kick Kicking and screaming is what I would say. They had to drag me into it kicking and screaming. Yeah, guys. I mean, we're seeing commodities outperform for the first time in years to the point where nobody still wants to own them. What do they want to own? They want to own yesterday's winners. You know, people are in there buying Zoom and Tesla and uh, you know some of these other stocks that are down 300 400% in the last year. But the thing is, when you look at the overall market, like we might be seeing that regime change, right? We're starting to see a more inflationary environment. So if you're going to bet on inflation, I wouldn't bet on the under, I'd bet on the over. And it's right in plain sight, right? I mean, we're seeing this huge rotation happen. And what we're seeing is a lot of investors right now, they still want to hold on to what did well the last 10 years, right? I mean, if I talk to a lot of clients, I talk to a lot of investors right now, like they're still on that growth trade. They still want to own all those big, large mega cap stocks like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, and, you know, look, they could go up here. It's possible. But, I mean, if we learned any lesson from the great tech bubble back in the late 90s, early 2000, is a lot of these big companies like Microsoft, the, the poster child for this, they can have a whole decade where the revenue continues to go up. The company does well, but the stock does nothing. And I think that's one of the bigger risks you have here with a lot of these hot names. It's not that they get crushed. It's just they don't do anything for like, you know, in some cases, it could be like a decade. Sounds like they're not wrong. They're just early. <laughs> I like that, Chris. You know, uh, somebody might say that's the sucker's rally, right? You get sucked into these stocks that don't have earnings, that's selling at these high 
price to sales ratios because they can't do a price to earnings ratio because they don't have any earnings. Uh, we've seen this show before. Doesn't mean it's over, but you know, you want to make certain that your portfolio has participation in the areas that are going to be strong going forward. What we call short duration assets, value stocks. You know, you want to own your bonds. You know, it's not too late to get out of the bond funds. Uh, they're going down every day. Hey, individual bonds are going down every day, but at least we know at some point we get all our money back and get to start over again. You don't have that with an open-ended bond fund. Yeah, and that's the one thing I think we see lacking more than anything right now when we look at portfolios, and we, we probably look at like 50 portfolios a month, is most of you don't have what we would call a pro-inflation portfolio, right? You don't have enough inflation hedges in your portfolio. You have too many assets that, that are reliant on low interest rates, low inflation, and to your point, Bob, it's like, unless you're living under a rock, you know, we're not going back to like less than 2% inflation like we saw the last decade. And, you know, interest rates aren't going back to, to under 1%. It's like just not happening. Well, going back to those long duration assets over the weekend, I was helping my brother-in-law who owns a farm up in upstate Pennsylvania. And uh, he was talking to me about, you know, disruption stocks like Tesla and how he wished he'd gotten in so much earlier. And I said, well, I said, who's the biggest farm equipment manufacturer you know? He said, John Deere. I said, well, you know what? I'd rather own John Deere this year than Tesla. He said, you're out of your mind? I said, no, T John Deere is up a lot more than Tesla is year to date. And that's the thing about investing. It's so counterintuitive. Nobody wants to own Deere. It didn't do anything in the last 10 years. Uh, of course, it's outperforming Tesla right now. And that's the problem with investing, right? We, it, more, more money comes in at the top of a strategy or top of a rally than at the bottom before the rally starts because, you know, everybody wants hindsight, wants verification. But, you know, there's no siren that goes off. There's no flag that's waved. There's no button. There's no red flashing light to say, hey, the opportunity is now. You know, the more painful the trade, the better the investment, I always say. Yeah, just not the instant gratification that you, you wish you could have. I wish, well, wish we could provide that, but my crystal ball broke, you know, like uh, 20 years ago when I got in the business. So that doesn't work anymore. But, you know, the other, the other thing I think is interesting right now, too, is we talk about this a lot, but like every economist, like I'm on all these shows, I do a lot of these shows and it's like everyone's talking about recession, you know, recession in, in 24 months, 12 months, like they try to pinpoint it exactly 30 months, we're going to have a recession. Like if anyone's that good, they could predict it. Um, but it just seems like the sentiment right now is so dour and so pessimistic. But I mean, the reality of it is, and we talk about this week after week, this economy looks good. <laughs> it doesn't look bad. The unemployment numbers, uh, they just came out last for last month. They were, they were fantastic again. We're down to 3.6% unemployment. Wages are going higher. Labor participation's going up. So it just seems like the underlying economic data still is so good, yet the narrative in the media is just still so, so negative. And as we've said in the past, the media is usually wrong. Those ex economists and strategists, they're usually wrong. Well, you know what, Ryan? I got to tell you, I'm really concerned. I, I didn't realize that your crystal ball was broken. I've been telling our clients to reassure them that you have, in fact, a working crystal ball and everything's going to be fine. Uh, you let the cat out of the bag. So thanks for that. Wait a second. My Magic 8 ball still is just as reliable as ever. So rest <laughs> assured, we got your back. Well, yeah, it's pretty incredible when you think about the uh, unemployment rate is now 3.6%. Um, you know, we had an all-time record low just before the pandemic, so I think we might even break that record. So you have, you know, job demand just through the roof. We don't have enough people to fill those jobs. We're importing, you know, the uh, jobs back from overseas because things are changing, right? Instead of having a just-in-time uh, supply chain, we want to have a just-in-case supply chain because no one wants to live through this disruption again. And I think that's going to start to happen, and you're going to see – you know, the cure for high prices is always higher prices, right? So, you know, I think you're going to start to see some of these commodity prices fall later this year. And as a result, inflation is going to come down. Expectations are going to come down. And I think the economy is going to be able to continue to grow. Yeah, because the one thing is, we know wages aren't coming down, right? The wage growth is going to continue. So you get inflation to come down a little bit and you keep wages going up, this is the combination you want. That's like, that's the sign of a really healthy, strong economy. Yet no one likes to talk about that in the news. I don't understand. They don't like to talk about how good things are and are probably going to be the rest of the year. It seems like we're the only ones espousing that type of, uh, that type of view. I got a dirty little secret for everybody. Uh, companies are enjoying some of these higher prices. You know, some of them are deserved, but in some cases, they're trying to boost their margins, and they're going to want to continue to boost their margins. Meanwhile, productivity's up, which we never saw back in the 70s, right? We had hyperinflation. We had high interest rates. 
but productivity was very, very low. Productivity is through the roof right now. And I think you're going to start seeing with earnings season coming up next week, we're going to have some surprises. But I think overall, you know, surprises will be the upside. That's what the market does, right? It's a discounting mechanism. It looks forward. You know, it's been a roller coaster so far this year. Hey, I got some advice. Don't get out of the car. Hey, I hope you're enjoying episode 79, Pain Points of Wealth. Thank you for our support that you've given us. We're up to 80,000 downloads. Your support helps us to continue to do this podcast. So if you like our podcast, love it. Give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Subscribe on Spotify. If this is on YouTube right now, click the like button. You can click the subscribe button. Click that notification bell so you can be updated every single week of all our new episodes and spread the good word. Anyone else can benefit from our weekly financial content, please let them know about the good word of pain points of wealth. Thanks for the support. We'll continue to do the podcast. Keep giving us the love. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And you know, Bob and Chris, with the thousand or so families we manage at our firm, Pain Capital Management, where we you know, handle over a billion dollars. And one thing we found is when it comes to making decisions about investments, it's extremely emotional. And a lot of times when you make decisions, you think you're being logical, but really emotional, you end up making really, really bad decisions when it comes to how to allocate your capital. So I thought we could talk today a little bit about some of the bad emotional decisions we make and how we really protect ourselves or can protect ourselves from getting our emotions involved and start making good, pragmatic, long-term decisions to create wealth over time and financial independence. Hey, guys, it's real simple. There's two huge emotions called fear and greed, and any decision made on either one of them has always historically been wrong. You know, the, uh, the fear is actually an acronym that stands for false evidence appearing real, and I'll give you guys a real-world example of this. Recently, you know, with the market downturn, a client of mine wanted to get out of the market, and I said, look, you know, you're going to pay incredible amount of capital gains by doing this. And I said, look, what if the market doesn't stay low? And then you also miss out on your dividends. So basically what he did was he made a decision that had a real impact, but the fear eventually subsided. Hey, Chris, you know what? I don't want you to discourage any client from panicking. It's one of my major indicators. When, when we have investors panicking, uh, which some of our clients will do, uh, when they actually do sell out of the market, it's one of my primary indicators of why we should be aggressively investing in the market. So I can't, want, I can't discourage everyone from being prudent and pragmatic like we are. Well, what's crazy about it is it's the only marketplace in the world where people want to do the opposite, right? I mean, when prices go low, people want to sell. The higher a price goes or the hotter a stock is, uh, you know, we have this inclination to buy. Like in any other marketplace, if you're going to go out buy a TV, buy a car, you're always more apt to buy if you can get a lower price, and you're always less apt to buy if the price is going to be too high. But throw that all out of the window when it comes to the stock market. In fact, I had a buddy, he had me look over his 401k. He's like, man, I just got hammered in my 401k. I'm like, yeah, well, what did you do? And I went through, and he just went and looked and saw whatever funds did the best in the last three years. He put all his money there, which meant it was all growth funds. And then, of course, they just got slaughtered recently. So it's just like we get so enamored with like what did best recently. And as we know, that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to your financial portfolio. It really is. And it's not just individual investors making those mistakes. I mean, I serve on a lot of boards for charitable institutions. And, you know, I always end up on the investment committee. You know, what a surprise. And it's incredible. Every investment committee looks back three years. And if something underperforms for three years, oh my goodness, they want to get rid of it so quickly. And if something's up big for three years, they want every dime invested there. So it doesn't matter if you're a professional investor or you're an individual investor, emotions play a big part. And again, it always helps you to make the wrong decision at the wrong time. Well, it's even worse than that. I mean, Wall Street is the biggest culprit, right? I mean, we look at, they say like 50 portfolios, new portfolios a month. We get a really good feel for like what every financial firm on the street is offering and they all end up overweighting whatever's the hottest. There's, they're no better than an individual investor when it comes to putting together portfolios. So you get a whole industry essentially overweighting like what's been hot. So when things aren't hot anymore, you have a whole industry that just gets hammered at the same time. It's nuts. It happens over and over again. Well, you know, guys, the biggest culprit of this is the annuity industry, the insurance industry, where they, they preach guaranteed returns. But if you look at how an annuity did, a fixed annuity over the last 10 years versus our portfolio, drastically underperformed. So people are missing out just because they're scared. Well, that's the biggest risk you have, Chris, of course, is inflation, right? Overcoming inflation is the really primary idea of investing your money. 
and annuities are the most horrible inflation hedge you could possibly have. But when you look at the history of the markets, and this is this is something that came came up at dinner the other night. It was a bunch of uh, old friends who are big real estate investors, um, and I told them, I said, you know, the market never goes down and stays down. It always makes you know new highs. And they said, no, no, that's not possible. And I said, what do you mean it's not possible? You know, <laughs> just take a look. And they said, no, no, I remember 2008. The market went down big. Yeah, it did. And if you didn't sell, you know, you made it all back. Plus, you've doubled or tripled your money since then. No, that can't happen. So, it's, you know, you think that when it, if you look at the history of the markets, that everybody knows that, but they don't. Uh, markets don't go down because they're, you know, forever because they're backed by real assets. No, it's a great point, Bob. And I remember back during the first housing boom, uh, right before the financial crisis, is there was a philosophy that people would tell me, oh, I only own real estate because it's real. I don't own stocks because it's a piece of paper. At the end of the day, that's not true. Right? Stocks are backed by physical assets. Well, that's the thing, though, right? But individual stocks are risky and can go to zero, just like my old mother Merrill did. Uh, almost went to zero before it was acquired by Bank of America. But the market doesn't go to zero ever um, because it is backed by real assets. Now, I hope and pray someday it does because I've always wanted to buy or own the Madison Square Garden if I can get it for nothing. I mean, that'd be great, right? If the market goes to zero, not only can I get Madison Square Garden, I can get a private jet, you know, because, you know, nobody needs them anymore. If the, comp if the company goes to zero, if the you know, economy goes to zero, all these assets are going to be free, right? Well, you know, Dad, I noticed down the shore you got that big oil tank in the yard from uh, when you bought <laughs> oil back in April of last year. I wish I had, Chris. Negative $37 a barrel. Bob Payne's Texas tea. But, you know, guys, there is times where it is appropriate, though, to factor in your emotions, right? Because I'm, I sit with a lot of people now, a lot of new clients that are coming in, we're reviewing their portfolio and they're saying, well, you know, I'm pretty smart. I can handle volatility. I'll be okay if it's down. And we go back and we run that report that shows what your portfolio looked like in 2009, down 50, 60%. And some folks are saying, yeah, I can handle that. But you know, they were 40 when that happened. Now they're 60 or they were 50 when that happened. Now they're 70. You have to think about emotionally how different you are, you know, when you're retired. Yes. And we delude ourselves, right? Because we think, oh, you look back in history and you can say, oh, the S&P 500 has done 10% a year. Why don't I just own the S&P 500? Well, the truth is you got to be able to stomach years where it goes down 50, 60%. So if let's say you have a couple million bucks and now all of a sudden you're down a million dollars on your portfolio, it feels like the world's falling in on you, but you're going to hold your portfolio Never seen it done. <laughs> and you can go through periods like the S&P 500, perfect example, where it does nothing for a whole decade. We saw a whole decade. If you were in the S&P 500, you made no money. So, you know, it sounds great to say I can just own the S&P 500, but in practicality, it's virtually impossible, especially if you're talking about creating real wealth that you're going to use for retirement. Like, you don't want that money just put into one index and hope for the best. It's too hard to do over long periods of time. Well, guys, simply put, you need to have a plan, right? That's why it's so easy for us to invest, why it's so common sense to us, because we work with the goal in mind, right? We start from the client's goals of achieving their lifetime income needs, and we work backwards to make sure that we get the amount of return we need to overcome inflation and taxation. There's no reason to take excess risk for the sake of taking excess risk, right? If you can, you know, you make an extra percent or two, you're not going to have a better life. But if you lose half, I'll tell you what, your life's going to be ruined. Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is literally what we do every single day. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach, you want to get a full review of your entire portfolio, of your entire financial plan, if you have over $750,000 saved for retirement, you can see if you qualify for a full free financial review. We'll literally go through everything for you. We'll go through every holding that you have. We'll build you your own personalized financial portal so you can get a bird's eye view of your entire net worth. We're going to hone in on every financial issue you have. We're going to look at all the fees you're paying, look at all the underlying costs in your portfolio, show how to reduce it, optimize your portfolio for taxes, put together a full income plan for financial independence so you can figure out exactly how to draw from your portfolio, and a full savings plan to make sure you're on track to get to all your goals, financially speaking. We literally do have limited spots. We do them every week. If you have over $750,000 saved for retirement, go to www.paincm.com financial plan. That's www 
paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, from 2000 to 2010, emerging markets appreciated more than 16% a year, whereas commodities returned about 6% a year, and then the NASDAQ, which was tech-related, only returned 1.6% a year. Now, fast forward for 2010, up until the present, the NASDAQ has returned 17% a year, whereas emerging markets have only returned 3% a year, and commodities negative 0.15% a year. How times change? Times do change, right? It just shows you how cyclical the markets are and how all markets, no matter how strong or how weak, revert to the mean. So you have you know, a 17 18% return a year for the NASDAQ. Chances are that's not going to happen over the next 10 years. And if you remember, when you left Merrill Lynch, we formed Payne Capital Management. You know, no one wanted to own the U.S., right? We had made so much money in the emerging markets, they wanted everything in the emerging markets. Um, now, everybody wants everything in the U.S. So, you know, the key is you got to be diversified. You know, you want to have your core holdings. But just think about these other categories as spare tires. You know, you go on a long trip, not every tire is dependable. Well said, Bob. I like that analogy. Chris. Archaeologists have discovered prehistoric human remains, ceremonial artifacts, and possibly the footprint of an ancient dwelling on the site of a planned 75-story residential condo tower in Miami. The findings are evidence of a civilization known as the Tequesta that existed more than 2,000 years ago. Well, all I can say, Ryan, is I hope those archaeologists aren't getting paid in Bitcoin and they're actually being paid in real money. <laughs> I feel bad for those real estate developers. You think you're going to get your project done, and then all of a sudden it becomes a national, national heritage site. Man, oh, man, no fun. Bob, 55 years ago, the photo session of the album cover for the Beatles' Sgt. Peppers took place. The final cost for the art was nearly 3,000 pounds, which was a huge sum of the time when album covers typically cost around 50 pounds. Yeah, just think what would happen today with Ringo with his uh, iPhone they wouldn't even need a photo shoot, right? They could just do it, you know, with their friends. It's amazing how some things become more expensive over time and some things, it just doesn't hold their value. It probably costs about 50 euros today to do an album cover of the same uh, magnitude. That's actually a good point. Deflationary, Bob. Or that cover art could be an FT and more, be worth millions today. <laughs> this is true. Start working on that, Chris. How do you figure this out, Chris? We got to figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. Over the long term, history shows the stock market has returned about twice as much as residential real estate based on data assembled by the NYU Stern School of Business. The S&P 500 returned 12.47% annually from 1972 to 2021 versus only 5.41% for residential housing. And if you look at 2012 to 2021, stocks averaged 16.98% when housing only averaged 7.38%. Well, you know what, Ryan? I think it speaks for itself. You know, got to love the stock market, got to love those passive investments. And to, do, to quote a Bobism here, real estate's that investment that talks back to you. Your bond portfolio will never call you in the middle of the night to let you know that the, the toilet's broken. So that's true. Uh, <laughs> all right. Another great show, gentlemen. If you like our content, love our content, please give us that five-star rating on iTunes. Leave us a comment. If it's on Spotify, you can subscribe. And if it's on YouTube, click that like notification. Click that subscribe button. And that notification bell is going to be updated every week of all our new content. That's it. Stay loose and keep an open mind.